The House of Mystery presents Inside Writing, the radio show where authors discuss their writing process in all genres. Now he's uh, got a book out called The Bothell Hell House, Poltergeist of Washington State. And this is uh, version 2.0, so he's got some updates. We'll talk about that. And uh, we'll talk about his story. Um, very, very interesting. So, uh, Keith Linder, welcome to the show. Hey, guys. Uh, good morning, and uh, thanks for uh, having me here. Thanks. It's a pleasure. So, uh, before we talk about what happened to you and the house, now, um, before you moved into that house in Bothell, before, um, what was your feelings on ghosts and uh, poltergeist and paranormal and stuff? How did you stand on it before all this happened? Uh, that's a good question. Um, prior to us moving in, my beliefs in, in regards to ghosts, um, I was not familiar with the term poltergeist. The only thing about poltergeist that I knew of was that scary movie that came out in the early mid eighties that was titled Portuguese and it didn't seem fun what they were going through in that house, but that's all I knew. I didn't know it was a phenomenon to itself or a scientific term in the paranormal community or a type of haunting. Uh but my perception of ghosts was always fifty fifty. Um I like a good ghost story every now and then from friends, family, uh, you know, legends or whatnot. And that's all, all I would give it. I mean, I, I never disavowed the possibility that ghosts are real. Um, I just thought it was interesting, but I never went out of my way to research it further. And having experienced this, this totally revised all of that. I mean, this totally was an abrupt crash course uh, into the haunting and into the different types of phenomena that I now know exists within the paranormal. So now this was what, in the year 2012, so not really that long ago, six, six, seven, six years ago, <laughs> losing my mind. So you and your girlfriend what, decided to move into this home. Um, did you know anything about it beforehand, or did you just find it on Greg's list, or how did that come? Yeah, we had been together, me and my girlfriend, two years already, and we had our own places. She had her place, I had mine. And I think about three months prior to moving in, we made or came to the decision to move in together. So yeah, we started looking for homes and we found this home on Craigslist. It was a, a rental posting. I think it was in March of April of that same year. Um, I emailed the homeowner and said I was interested. And he even said during the first email that, hey, the home is not yet ready. Uh, it will be ready in the month of May. I'm just trying to get it early and get it filled and occupied as soon as possible. But I will keep your name and phone number and call you around April. And he did. And when he called us in April, um, we went to go see it. It was vacant then. And uh, two weeks later, um, after a lot of paperwork and whatever, um, we qualified and he let us have the home. And, yeah, we moved in May 1st of that year, 2012. How was it when you looked at it? Did you get any uh, weird feelings, or did you, were you really like, this is a great place and excited, or how, what was your initial um, thoughts? Yeah, we had looked at a lot of homes prior to seeing this one, and none of them really struck us as a place that we wanted to live in, except this one. This was a, a new home. This home was really built uh, in 2005. The neighborhood itself was built in 2005. Um, it's a two-story home, a uh, modern neighborhood, and, yeah, as soon as we saw the home, uh girlfriend liked it, I liked it, and, yeah, I think we went home and emailed the homeowner right away to say, we really like this house, how can we get it? And, uh, no, there was nothing that stood out, nothing weird, nothing, you know, no signs of, you know, damage to the walls or dents here and there to where you, where you would ask the question, Hey, how did that get there? What, what, what's that? What's that about? Um, it was a relatively brand new home, um, and it wasn't speaking to us not yet, anyways. So it was easy to determine that we wanted to live there. Oh, it's going to start speaking to us soon, yeah. 
Oh, he caught me off guard with that when you said, not yet. I was like, uh-oh. Now, um, yes. let me kind of uh, uh, amend Al's question. Um, you know, it, it's not unusual for a new home, but was there anything about the area, about the land, that was unusual, or were there rumors about that area? Yeah, there were rumors. Of course, um, we found these rumors after we moved in, but there was rumors about um, Snohomish County in general, uh, the city of Bothell in general, and the neighborhood called Thrasher's Corner that's in Bothell. Um, you know, different um, urban legends, historical, some factual, um, a lot of Native American history in and around the area. Uh Upon research of the land and the home, we went back to the early 1800s when Bothell was founded, and there were a lot of um, settler versus Native American clashes during the formation of Bothell within a few hundred yards of the house, mind you. But, of course, in 2012, I mean, you're looking at 80, 200-plus houses, all of them are brand new. Um, those houses are sitting on top of that history. Um so, yeah, we, I had to go pull up microfilm and all that later on to find out the true nature of the area. But nothing sunk to us. Uh, our neighbors were not experienced because we asked them, and so did the investigators. Um, nobody was saying, hey, my house is weird, too, or, hey, this happened to my house when I first moved in, or um, similar to what Keith and Tina were experiencing. But it just in this house in particular, out of the 200 odd houses in the neighborhood just seem to have a life of its own. So did the activity begin right away, or was this like a slow buildup? Uh, what was the first few things that you noticed? Uh, yeah, uh, the house, I mean, the activity did begin right away, and it was a slow buildup. Um, the day we went to get the keys to the house, me and my girlfriend, uh, which was May 1st, um, the homeowner left, and me and my girlfriend are sitting on the living room floor, and we're just talking, me and her, and the house is very, I mean, it's empty. And during the middle of our conversation, we hear a kid cough. I mean, it was pretty loud, very distinctive. There's no mistaking what that was because we looked at each other, and we said at the same time, was that a kid cough? And it came or sounded like it came from one of the rooms upstairs. Now, we didn't get up from our uh, seat or where we were sitting at the time to go investigate because obviously that's not a, there's nobody there because my, the homeowner just left. So we didn't go research it. We didn't investigate it. We shrugged it off. And two weeks later, we moved in or we started the process of moving in. And that's when items started missing. The first thing to go missing that I noticed was my extra set of car keys. And I kept these car keys in a glove box. I don't even think Tina knew this glove box existed, but I would go to this glove box periodically for other items, and I noticed my car keys were no longer in there. And a few days after that, we started noticing uh, silverware. Um depleting of silver work. and I would ask Tina, she would ask me, hey, I thought we had more forks than this. I thought we had more knives and spoons. And Tina would come to me and say, have you seen my earring, my bracelet, my jewelry? Um, and we're, we're far from connecting the dots, Kevin, because these are things that we sort of thought, well, maybe we lost these things during the moving process. It seems kind of weird to lose all these things because, I mean, it was a very simple move, but maybe these items will show up over time in a different box, in a different cabinet or whatever. Um, but the truth finally came home when about two months into living in the home, uh, we're watching TV now. Now we're sort of getting settled in, and me and Tina are sitting side by side watching television, and there's a four-foot-tall plant that sits right next to the entertainment center. And I kid you not, it levitates off the floor. I mean, it darts straight up off the floor. 
in front of both of us and does a 360 degree spin and then falls back to the ground and we both saw that because we're both facing the same direction and we leap up from our couch because we're thinking number one did that just happen mm-hmm. and i'm yeah. glad tina was there with me when i saw it because um when you see things together, you don't have to, you already rule out the process of, okay, now I gotta go tell Tina what I just saw, or vice versa. And that person might be thinking, well, you might have interpreted that wrong. But we both saw it, and we leaped toward the plant, and we thought we were being pranked. We thought we were being, this is a welcome to the neighborhood type of prank. Uh, some neighbors, kids, teenagers, obviously. Maybe this is a demented landlord or homeowner pranking us, but no wire, no remote control device, nothing, no string, no invisible or fishing line. And then that's when I said right then and there to Tina, I think our house is haunted. Well, yeah, because you can't, like you said, you can't explain that away. Um, and especially with another witness. You know, you if it was just you, you could almost rationalize it to yourself. You know, like we just we just went through a rationalization process, but with both of you seeing it at the same time, and you can't explain something like that away. And and even if you could, that's a feat in and of itself to to do, you know, to u- utilize yeah. some type of of trickery. Yeah, and even and I put in my even because uh, I, I wrote that in my book when I said to, to pull that type of trickery off or prank off. There's so many variables at play. I mean, these people, obviously, they would have to be trying to do this from the outside of the house. Um, I don't even know how you would approach a trickery like that. Um, and then to pull it off successfully, because it was successful. I mean, you, you made a plant levitate a few inches off the ground, spin, and keel mm-hmm. over in the front of both of us. So you must have eyes in the house to, number one, see that we're watching TV together, and to do that. But yeah, the brain goes through this whole thought process of trying to rationalize and the obvious sometimes is so obvious to where rationalization is not needed, but a plant levitate, I mean, we all know plants don't levitate, so it's not that much rationalization that you have to go through. And yeah, I was glad that Tina was there and we were both startled, not fearful, fear has not set in yet, um, but we were both startled and we and we went backwards in time thinking, oh, that's what the kid cough is about. That's what the missing items uh, was about. And keep in mind, at that time, we had, had items appear, like kid toys throughout the house that were wired in it, were sitting out in the open. And Tina didn't have any kid toys. I didn't have any kid toys. But you would come back into a room and you would see kid toys on the floor, on the staircase, or the kitchen counter. So we went back to the kid cough and said, I think we have a kid ghost living in this house. Now, I'm thinking like an, an investigator. After this occurred, you know, let's, let's take it step at a time. After this occurred with the plant, afterwards, was there anything unusual about the plant? Like, did it did it die faster than the others or, you know, or the opposite? You know, did it flourish more than other plants? Um I mean, certainly you didn't just put the plant back and say, okay, you know, I'm glad that's over. Well, did you observe the plant yeah. any, any more? Well, interesting thing about this plant is um, it's an artificial plant. Oh, okay. Other parts of the house that were real died mysteriously, and a lot of them were thrown. This plant, we had to move several times throughout the house because... Uh, and I, and keep in mind, I, the, I didn't know this term then, I know it now. It was teleporting, aporting throughout the house. Mm-hmm. I mean, you put this plant in the living room by the window and you go take a shower and you come out of your shower and the plant is sitting in your bathroom doorway. That's how far it's moved. And Tina's not even in the house, it's just me. Tina's gone to work. And we would sometimes wake up to find the plant. You sit it here, it's over here. I'm talking about it's downstairs when we saw it last. Now it's upstairs in the doorway of our bedroom or hallway. 
So this plant got maneuvered or manipulated quite a few times um, in the house. The other plants, which were really much smaller, that had pottery and foliage, those got thrown a lot. And, and all the plants that got thrown got thrown so much, I mean, they just died. We, Tina would have to repottery it, put them back in new pottery, but they would just ultimately die. And then some researchers told us to bring more plants in the house as a means of trying to add positive energy. But I'm, t- I'm telling you, these plants would die within the day or week's time. Hmm. So uh, what was your next move? Um, all of a sudden, uh, you had this this event happen. You both saw it. You're both thinking, okay, this place might be haunted. There's something going on here. Uh, what, what was the next thing you did from that? Did you seek out any help, or uh, what was your next move? Yeah, we went to the Internet, and I, we started Googling the term ghost or kid spirit. What do you do when your house is haunted or you believe there's a spirit there? We typed the word kid ghost. And the recommendations from a lot of websites was um, spirits get lost, spirits get trapped. Um, Probably very few are ever malevolent. What you want to do is try to talk to them, calm manner, and sort of guide them to to some sort of light. And ask them what they want and be sincere. Uh, And we did that. I guess the reaction that we got was not the reaction that the websites told us. The reaction that we got was more objects were thrown. I'm talking about while we're asking questions. Uh, The loud banging started soon after. And these bangs, I mean, you hear them, but you can't pinpoint where they're coming from. And that's when more objects like the plants I told you about and the bar stools started being thrown or slide across the floor. And that was probably because, like I said, the reaction from the Internet was things should temper down or quiet down if you can walk the spirit out to this light. And if it's a kid goes, it might have been left behind to something tragic. And we tried all that, but the, the adverse effect was, I mean, things seemed to escalate. Um, then we had the house bus. We called the churches in the area. I uh, told them that, hey, we're a new couple. We got a new home. We appreciate it. Um, if we would have it blessed, and they and they did, we didn't mm-hmm. tell them all the activity we were having, but they they came in and, and blessed the house. Um, and things would die down for forty eight hours or seventy two hours, but when it came back, it always resumed where it left off with more objects being thrown, um, the loud banging, objects missing, and then once again items that neither one of us owned would appear. Did Did you ask the landlord then, or check to see? if he had had problems with it before or previous tenants or anything? Not yet. Um, Believe it or not, I was embarrassed to ask him at that point in time. We're about six months, eight months into the home. Um, I didn't really have much data to give him to except to say, I mean, for me and Tina, we were thinking, well, if we tell this landlord we got items flying or debris flying, he might think we're crazy. I uh, think, you know, who, who are these guys living in my house now? I did finally ask them in 2014 because the activity did subside all of 2013. There was a point in time where we had zero activity, in it, and that was all of 2013. Oh, okay. uh, when it came back in March of 2014, let me tell you, the activity that we experienced and witnessed in 2014 makes what we saw in 2012 pale in comparison. I mean, there's no even, it could, the activity of 2012 can't even hold a candle, uh, to what we saw in 2014 because they came back with full force of vengeance and the gloves had really come off. Uh, we're not playing with you guys anymore. We're back. We're in effect. Um, then I started creating a diary, a video diary, an auto diary of all the activity taking place. And when I finally presented the evidence, what I compiled to the land, the homeowner, I asked him, and he told me that he, he's never had anything go wrong in the house. To his knowledge, other tenants have not had any activity. Um, so he was very nonchalant, very calm, 
uh, very dismissive, though, in the sense that he didn't probe me for any sort of questions that I was hoping for, or he, or he didn't even challenge me on my assumption. I mean, I was making a huge claim about his house, and not once did he put me on the defensive or whatever, but um, later research, and this is in the book, later research, uh, there was a, a family before us who lived in the house four years before we moved in, and I did find them because their mail kept coming to the house, and I talked to the homeowner or then the people that lived in the house on Facebook, and they told me the house for them was a living hell. They stayed in the house between 8 to 11 months, and it was the beginning of the end in that place is how she described it. What did they experience? Uh, she told me, and, and keep on when I'm, when I'm interviewing her via Facebook, I'm not yet sharing my cards of what we've experienced. I just told her we had some weird stuff going on, and I would appreciate if she could elaborate on what they went through or seen. And the first thing she told me was, oh, kitchen cabinets banging. Uh, we'd wake up in the morning and find all the kitchen cabinets open. Uh, I knew that because that happened to me and Tina numerous times. She said items, uh, the electrical systems in the house would go off and on, like the lights, the television, um, the microwave, and I knew that because that was happening to us. She said one day she was outside on the patio in the backyard having a cigarette, and she left her child in the high, in a high chair and baby formula on the stove. And these are her words, not mine. She said right before she was about to turn and go back into the house, the sliding door slammed shut and closed on her and locked and she had to uh, use a rock outside. It was a rock or something that she had to use to break into her own house through the sliding door because the door slid and locked itself and she was scared and worried because her baby was crying and it was formula on the stove. So she told me that. She told me about her son who reported, you know, seeing shadow figures out the corner of his eye. Uh, she did have a nanny. The nanny would often tell them while both husband and wife were away on business that of the loud footsteps in the night, the loud banging, and then the kitchen cabinets. So I, all that I had knew had to be true because we had experienced all of that and more. Um, she did not put it or, I guess, point to spirits or poltergeists or anything. They just moved. They, they moved, no questions asked. Uh, and, but she said there was always a, a bad vibe about the house. Um, she did admit to being suicidal. She tried to commit suicide four times in the house. During the course of this activity, uh, she always felt that it was the house that was the root cause of all of that. And she blamed the house for destroying her and her husband's marriage. Hmm. Wow. Well, did you talk to any of the neighbors or um, let them know what was going on? Or did any of the neighbors have the same sort of problem? Yeah. Well, my, my, I had, when I guess the cat was out the bag was um, April of 2014. We had had so much activity, me and Tina, to where, I mean, we were almost literally running out the house screaming. I mean, that, that day was a bad day. So we had found a paranormal team in Seattle, and they had said they would come over. I mean, we was having activity, and they came over within a few hours. And when they got there, they pulled up in their paranormal trucks and vans. And on their vans is, you know, Unbelievable! You know the, the name of their paranormal organization. So the cat was out the bag. And neighbors are seeing all these vans pull up <laughs> with the word paranormal and a ghost icon up there. So uh, neighbors would come out and sit on their porch and be like, "What's going on at Keith's house?" And then the paranormal researchers would knock on their doors and with clipboards in hand and ask them. Uh, the interesting thing about the family that lived to the right of me, the husband and wife that lived to the right of me, was they have a dog, and. You know, everybody knows people walk their dogs in the neighborhood, and you got to go past people's houses or whatever. Um, the neighbors said, without first knowing how haunted our house was, is their dog does not go or refuses to go on the inside of their house on the wing that's closest to our house. So the left wing of their house, they have a two-story house. For some odd reason, the pet does not like to go on the left wing of the house. Uh, no dog in that neighborhood, multiple neighbors have told me, no dog in that neighborhood would ever try to attempt to poop in our lawn or sidewalk grass area. 
Um, and that was very interesting. But well, that's a good thing. Nobody so there, ever, yeah, so there is a benefit to it. <laughs> that was positive. That, that, that I put in the favor of, you know, if you're going to find a, one silver lining out of this, that's good. So that, I kept the, the animals at bay. Um, but people always, and going back to the, when we first moved in, and like I said, you don't realize this stuff on day one, but I remember we were outside moving my furniture and me and my, my guy friends, and a neighbor from across the street, you know, there's always one guy in the whole neighborhood or, or female that watches everybody's houses yeah. and knows sort of the history from an outside point of view. So he comes walking over, he's got a beer in his hand, he's like, hey, my name is da-da-da-da-da, and I see you guys are moving in, congratulations, welcome to the neighborhood. And then he's like, you know what? It's interesting. Nobody stays in that house long. And, you know, we're, we're, we're carrying couches and love seats in and, um, we're both, I mean, me and my friends were all laughing and giggling because, you know, we're in a good mood, me moving into the house. But he told me that and I, and I was like, oh, that's interesting. He's like, yeah, every time it always seems that somebody's either moving in in this house or moving out. And that was on day one or week two of moving in when we're moving in that I thought that was interesting. But I didn't give it any. I didn't give it any thought until we're months and months into the house, and then that's when I started, like I said, researching to find some of the previous tenants, and I did find one, the one I told you about. So you said yeah. that that the local um, Seattle paranormal team came, and um, I guess that they left. Did they did they discover anything or um, anything that? Um, yeah. Nope. Yeah, no bull paranormal. That's in there. They're, they're out of uh, Snohomish. Uh, we found them, and they, they investigated the house uh, for eleven hours that day. Um, interesting, the things that they found were, and they and they were able to document or video record. I guess um, they noticed or picked up white mist coming from the floor in the hallway. And if anybody's familiar with my case, you know the hallway is ground zero for all activity uh, for various reasons. Um, they picked it up on their IR camera and their CCTV devices. Um, I didn't know what that mean or meant, um, and they sort of knew, and they found it very interesting. Um, I later learned that certain Portuguese cases, there are reporting of mist. Uh, and I saw it. It was coming from the floor right outside my office, and that's where I saw the two apparitions right outside my office. Um, they picked up uh, various voices. Um, they picked up the thundering footsteps. Uh, all their batteries, meaning cell phone, EMF devices, voice recorder, and other gadgets, all died as soon as they crossed the, the, the front door. As soon as they walked up to the front door, everybody's cell phone died. I remember that was very interesting. So as everybody walked in and all their gear went um, dead because they had to recharge it. It took them three hours or more to recharge everything, which sort of delayed the investigation. Um, but also, um, upon leaving the house, uh, the lead investigator, she was, um, I guess, a, a spiritual guide or a slash shaman. She wanted to cleanse the house with, or smudge it, I should say, um, her stage stick lit itself. Really? It, I, I did notice it in photographs that there's a lot of burning going on. It, would you attribute that yeah. to this? Uh, well, I can, well, I mean, by burn, I mean, there was a lot, a lot of objects caught fire in that house. Um, be it spontaneously or whatever, or with no heat agent or source agent. But me and Tina have seen objects catch on fire, and nobody's within inches of that item. Three Bibles caught fire um, in the home. Uh, the poster that was on my wall is a Final Fantasy poster uh, that I had um, that caught fire, and the fire department did respond to that fire because I dialed 911. Um, there's also a chapter in my book where I talk about my computer, my whole office computer system caught fire, and we had put the fire out, me and Tina, but the fire relit itself strangely in front of both our eyes. It was like the fire, I mean, it was weird how we doused the fire, and then within an eye blink, it just flared up again. So, yeah, there were several fires. Um, the fact that her sage stick lit itself, 
again, surprised because at that time we had had maybe two or three objects already catch fire. Um, but once again, me and Tina being sort of thrown into the paranormal, um, we didn't know this is all textbook poacher guys. This is what poacher guys do. This is what mm-hmm. gives them their name. We just thought, I mean, we, we thought, this is, this is hell. This is, this is hell on earth. Um, going back and, and looking at other past poacher guys cases, they all have a familiar or similar theme of doing this type of stuff. And we didn't know at the time that, cause our smudging, me and Tina, when we smudged, I could tell you the activity would sometimes escalate within hours of us smudging or especially the day after. These spirits responded negatively to smudging. I mean, the first wall writings in my house, the 666 and upside down cross was written with a sage stick with ash from a sage stick. Um, and I couldn't duplicate that. I don't know how the spirits were able to pick a, a burnt stick and write on every wall in my office because I tried to duplicate it myself and couldn't do it. But it was definitely ash from the sage stick because when I leave for work, my sage stick might have been 9, 10, 11 inches long. I come back, it's 4 inches long, and I have wall writings all over my office wall, and it's ash. You, you know, you can smell the ash, and it smells like white sage. Now, you know, we, we, we're talking, I think it's... I'm trying to formulate a thought here. There's a difference between a ghost and a poltergeist. And yeah. it, it almost sounds like we're, we're, we're talking about a malevolent demonic haunt. If it's taking a sage stick and writing 666 on the walls, it's saying two things. Uh, first of all, I'm malevolent. Second of all, your sage doesn't mean a thing to me. Look, I'm going to take something that's sacred to you, and I'm going to use it for my own purposes. And, yeah, when we, yeah, go ahead. Uh, and now a, a poltergeist generally, and I don't know if this is what the, the, the paranormal group said or not, I, I, I don't know what their theories are, but generally a poltergeist is self-generated by the agent themselves, usually through, through high psychic energy or, you know, uncontrolled uh, emotional energies that are going out into the atmosphere and formulating into this almost like a thought form it, did you guys ever think of that theory or, or did you have you know explore that theory that maybe this is something that we are generating somehow ourselves unknowingly uh yeah no i mean when we when i finally got a hold of um some more researchers nikki novelli uh, parapsychologist Steve Mara and his researcher Don Phillips and Nick Kyle from the Scotland SFPR and those guys did come to the house and they lived in it for relatively two to three weeks. Uh, Nikki and her team lived in the house for three weeks. Um, and these are the words, this is their conclusion or their words, not mine, is there were so many variables in that house. I mean, you could take five known theories about the paranormal, be it intelligent haunting, Mm-hmm. Uh, poltergeist, demonic haunting. Take your pick. There's evidence in this house that suggests on all counts. Because keep in mind, you're right. Some of the wall writings in the the fires definitely point to something strongly malevolent, strongly powerful to be able to do something like that every day for four months straight, mind you. And at the same time, you have other stuff happening that points to uh, calculating, manipulating. Um, me and Tina were at that point now being manipulated against each other. Uh, Stephen Don picked up over 500 EVPs in the house alone on on first trip. 85% of those EVPs were they considered Class A EVP. I mean, these are clear. And they picked up various different types of voices, male, female, child, older child, young child, older male, young male, older female, somewhat Irish accents, which we know Bothell in the 1800s had a huge mass flux of Irish settlers that migrated to Bothell. Some of the EVPs were Native American in nature. Some of the writings were Native American, uh, uh, I guess, pictography. So all of that, and then the shadow figures, and I've seen them. I mean, it was it was take your pick. Um, I would I, I would honestly say um, 
the reason I don't think me and Tina were ever any part of an agent is based on what the what I know from the previous tenant, meaning the one who lived in the house five years before us, because what they experienced and witnessed, and keep in mind, and I, and I talk about this in, my, in my, there's a chapter in my book called The White or The Gray Lady and The White Lady. Now, these two apparitions that I saw, I saw right outside my office doorway. And, Kevin, you might appreciate this. The apparitions themselves looked identical to the previous tenant. I'm talking about the mother. Okay? Now, the mother is alive, living in Yakima at the time, and she told me the house was a hell for them. She was suicidal. They had all kind of things going on in the house, abuse, domestic abuse, depression, you name it. They had it. Her son was very sick. He developed meningitis mysteriously in the house. Uh, he was he had autism. He spoke of seeing shadowy figures. And I'm seeing this apparition, and the more I see this apparition in my house, I'm like, I know that face. I can't pinpoint it yet, but I know that face. And then finally one day I was chatting with the previous tenant, a video chat again on Facebook, and I'm like, that's her. And that's, and I don't know how her imprint got frozen or whatever, but there are theories out there in various books, once again, poetry guys or whatever, um, that talk about a crisis apparition. I guess that's a term mm -hmm. to use is like crisis apparition. And, yeah, the first time I saw the gray lady, she turned off my light and took off running down the hallway. She literally did. I heard the click. I saw her standing in the doorway. It looked like the previous tenant. The second time I saw her would be almost two years later. Uh, this time she's walking in the hallway. And she's white now. And, she, and none of these apparitions are translucent. They're all full body, mind you. And she's Man. walking, but she's not making any eye contact. And she's holding something but I can't make out what she's holding. And it's almost like watching a film or a movie because there's no interaction like there was with the gray lady, but there's rustling sounds, like a leaves or paper rustling as she's walking. I heard the rustling before she passed my, uh, I guess, a line of sight. And that's what, that's what made me turn toward the doorway. She turned the corner, and there she was. And you see her, you hear the rustling. She goes into the room to the right of me. And as soon as she goes into that room, the rustling stops. And once again, that characteristic of rustling noises has been attributed to malevolent hauntings. Mm -hmm. uh, once more, uh, the, I guess the rectory or the Borley Rectory House spoke of that a lot. But it was all fascinating. And Steve, I mean, every researcher that came to the house answered a few questions, but everybody leaves having more questions than answers because it was, it was just a treasure trove of, okay, this is running smack dab into this theory because you're right. Where's the agent here? Majority of the activity that me and Tina had in the house, we were not even even in the home. We're at work. I mean, my job, she's at her job. We come home, and it looked like Hurricane Sandy had just ran through our house. <laughs> now, um, I, I'm high-centered on something that you said early on in the interview, and, and I kept meaning to come back to this. When you okay, I can understand objects going missing. You know that that's fairly common in in some haunts yeah. and types of haunts. But you had objects appearing, children's toys out of yeah. nowhere. Yeah, and that and let me tell you a good story or a good event. One day, I mean, there's a you know there's a kitchen drawer in our in our kitchen, and this drawer now we turn into a silverware. Which is what we put our silverware. One day I go into the kitchen to retrieve silverware out this drawer. As soon as I open it, a woman's been in the house months by then, maybe three or four months. I open up this drawer to retrieve a silverware, and all these envelopes start piling out. I mean, it was almost, I mean, just piling out envelopes after envelopes after envelopes. It was stuck. I mean, the drawer was stuck. And... I like where does all this come from? I'm like, when do we turn this drawer into a place where we put our mail? But I looked at the envelopes and the dates are three, four years before we even moved in. And the names on the envelopes are of people who lived in the house. It's got the right address. It's got the names of people who lived into the house years before we moved in. 
But there's no way these envelopes were here when we first got here. There's no way, because number one, we would have noticed them already. And they were, it was not one envelope, I'm talking about 20 to 30 of them. And they just started piling out. And I would look at them and Tina, and we look at, you know, thank God, because there's time stamps on them, postage time stamps. And we're looking at the dates, you know, April, May, 2007, 2008, 2009. 2011 different home tenants names and you like and i've had stuff missed there's stuff to this day that i have never gotten back i've lost bills i've lost credit cards wallets car keys several times car keys car fobs uh tina's jewelry i have to believe and i have to believe these items are somewhere and they may be appearing in other people's homes right now they might be appearing in other people's homes throughout the world and I'm talking about poultry guys because these items mm -hmm. that we found, mm -hmm. they're not ours. The kid toys, I mean, some of these kid toys, mind you, are dated. These are old toys. These are not toys that you would normally find in the last four or five, six years. I mean, we're finding toys. I'm finding Hot Wheel cars that go back to the 70s, to the 60s, a um, whole bunch of stuff, a book, um, other items, and they're out in the open for you to see, like the spirits want you to see them, and it, it, it makes no sense. I mean, yeah, and that to me was more fascinating than our stuff disappearing because, um, yeah, it's only me and Tina living in the home. Now, did two two obvious questions? Um, did you ever install cameras and and try to observe this for yourself? And why didn't Zach and his crew, why didn't they find anything? Did they come during 2013? Yeah, that's a good question. So, um, yeah, one of the things, because I'm an IT professional, and when the activity came back in 2014, um, I was advised by some paranormal teams and by my own curiosity, because there, there was a fascination level within myself, to try to capture this phenomena on video camera because I have to tell people and people want to see things on video or photo just to substantiate. Well, um, so I put cameras in every room, every house, and these are motion detect IR cameras that alert and that will send email to my inbox or whoever's inbox when motion or sound are detected. And they did. They they sent me a lot of stuff. I was able to know where my house was being attacked. There's several chapters in my book that, that go through this long, lengthy process of getting mass emails. I'm at work, and all of a sudden my phone is blowing up. I look in, and my house is being destroyed in real time. Um, so, yeah, the cameras were there, and that's how I was able to build up a huge database of capturing some of the photos I sent you the other day and put a lot of it on YouTube and Facebook and other websites. But Keep in mind, I'm also doing something that the spirits love, and I didn't notice at the time, is I'm giving them an enormous amount of attention. I'm giving them more electronic devices to play with, to control, and to manipulate. And I can tell you this, the spirits say, well, Keith, if you're going to bring in the cameras, then that's fine, but it's going to be our rules. We're going to control what you see and don't see. Keep in mind, they started unplugging some cameras, uh, turning some cameras around, upside down. Some cameras went missing. Some cameras were thrown or destroyed. I'm talking about to the brinks of powder. Um, they started manipulating within the Wi-Fi, within the router, within the MAC addresses. All of that, and they started escalating the other activities in the house because every camera that they stole or broke and took, guess what I did, not knowing that that was a good thing to do is I went out and bought more cameras. So now it's a cat and mouse game. Fast forward to, I guess, October, November, or November, December, when Ghost Adventures came. Uh, what I tell people is, and the episode doesn't show that, um, and anybody who understands paranormal, especially Portuguese or whatever activity, knows that activity tends to happen in a bell curve fashion. Mm -hmm. There seems to be either be on the receiving or the early end of the bell curve or the toward the tail end of it. Ghost adventures arrive at the tail end of the bell curve because 
at the very top of a bell curve, we're screaming, we need help, we need help, we need help. By the time help responds, we're now at the low end. Ghost Adventures arrived in November, and when they arrived, they were only in the house for five hours, which is nothing from an investigator's point of view for actual research. Um, so they investigated the house, and that was during their, you know, the infamous lockdown format that they used. Regardless of the location, they stick to the format of locking down the house, and we're investigating it from 12 a.m. to 3 a.m. or 4 a.m., and that's all they do. You're not going to catch the type of action we have in that time frame because keep in mind, most of the activity that we had happened during the daytime. It happened when either me and Tina were not home or when we were home, coming home from work or when we were sleeping. If you saw the episode, you saw that Ghost Adventures didn't even have us be present at the lockdown. Um, that played a role, or I believe played a role in also them not obtaining uh, substantial evidence but the overall reason why they got little activity, I tied to the moment they arrive, which is toward the end of the bell curve of the activity. The spirits are able to go dormant um, at will when certain researchers arrive, and the amount of time that they actually spent in the house investigating. And that's, I mean, they, they knew that coming in. I, they gave me their, their schedule two months before they arrived, and I even told Tina. I don't think they're going to get anything. If this is all they're going to commit to the investigation, they committed three days to doing reenactments and interviewing, but they only committed five hours to actual researching, and you're not going to get anything in that, that time frame. The other teams that were successful got stuff because they investigated 12 hours or more, or they lived in the mm-hmm. house. Steve Mara and Don Phillips lived there. And there's a difference between, okay, this is your room, Steve, this is your room, Don, and you're sleeping there 24-7 because you hear the knocks, the banging, the rapping sounds, the pitter-patter. They got equipment running 24-7, Steve and Dawn. Nikki and her team does too. There's people watching them remotely uh, 3,000, 6,000 miles away. So everybody's backing up everybody, and they live in the house. And they have me there. You know, They have me there to answer questions. And when something happens and they see it, they know where I'm at. All the stuff that Steve and Don found, talking about the cameras being moved or turned upside down, I was standing next to Steve and Don when it happened. So, um, yeah, difference is night and day as far as investigative methods uh, yeah. between they found and what Ghost Adventures did find. Yeah, I, I, I've done that before. I've set up IP cameras and watched from my house um, for you know days at a time. Hmm. Well, it's been a really good conversation. And for people that want to find out more, um, they can pick up the book. It's it's newly updated. It's called The Bothell Hell House. And it's Poltergeist of Washington State. Uh, Keith Linder is the uh, author. And we'll have it linked on our page as well, so people uh, listening can just click on and purchase the book. Well, Keith, thank you very much for taking the time to tell us about your experience. Oh, once again, thanks for uh, having me on. Good questions, uh, good back and forth, and uh, I was glad to be on. Uh, what I'd like to reiterate about the book to your listeners is a lot of what we talked about, I'm talking about the evidence and the phenomena that broke out. Um, the reason the book is called 2.0 is because there's a lot of video and audio links to a lot of the EVP and to a lot of the phenomena. The reader's going to really enjoy being able to click on those and actually see the evidence that teams found, not me, most of these are what the teams found that they substantiated and are classifying as evidence. So, yeah, by all means, listen to the EVPs, uh, digest all that, comb through it, and go to the websites and judge for yourself and understand that the case is still officially open. And, um, yeah, there's a lot of good stuff in there. To find out more about our show, guests, or to listen to past shows from our archive, please go to www.houseofmysteryradio.com. Show's over for now. Was it as good for you as it was for me? Well, good night. This has been a production of Something Weird Media. I'll be back.